Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Kevin Johnson of Devo Knives, or Kev from Lefty EDC Knife and Gear Review Channel on YouTube. For a little over a year and a half, Kev has been offering his take on folding knives and other EDC gear from a lefty's perspective. He's that guy they're talking about in knife review videos when they say, sorry, lefties, if the clip doesn't swap to the other side. Now, this perspective is important to represent in the knife review world, but even more important is a steady supply of ever more savvy knife designs and designers to dream them up. That's what happened when Kev met Colin and they started Devo Knives. We'll find out all about the birth of one of the coolest sheep's foot folders to hit the market, the Devo Knives Stout, and we'll get to know Kev right here. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and then download the show to your favorite podcast uh, app and listen to us whilst you drive or mow the lawn or do the dishes. That's what I do. You can also join us on Patreon, where you get bonus uh, knife content, including interview extras and monthly knife giveaways. Just check it out by going to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Kev, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks, Bob. How's it going? It's going great. Uh, congratulations on the release of Devo Knives' first knife, the Stout. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations. It's come out to a lot of really great reviews. Yeah. Yeah, we're really uh, happy about that, and uh, we're excited. So. Okay. All right. We're gonna we're gonna dig into the whole process of an enthusiast turning into a knife sure. company owner and designer. But first, yeah. uh, we got to find out a little bit about you. How did how did this obsession with knives uh, blossom in you? Yeah, that's funny because uh, when I had talked to you about doing this, I was trying to think of an answer to that question because I I really don't have a good one. Like my grandfather didn't have a you know a buck one ten on his hip and taught me how to whittle sticks and whatever uh, my dad's not into knives nobody in my family really is um i think i i got kind of into the gun hobby or firearm hobby um when i was like 18 or 19 and i kind of went down that rabbit hole for a while and um that led me to youtube that led me to people like nothing fancy and mm -hmm. whatever and that led to knives that led to Nick Shabazz and that kind of blossomed the whole knife thing for me. And then COVID kind of put it into overdrive. Um, so that's kind of, you know, how I got to being into knives and then, you know, I always had knives, but I didn't start collecting them. That's a bad word, but that's kind of the term people would use um, until, you know, a few years ago, uh, four or five. And then, like I said, COVID just, you know, it went on um, sport mode. And, you, and mean, then, uh, you, know, you mean you see your output for YouTube just spiked? Is that what you mean? No, I mean like buying knives. I didn't have a YouTube channel then. Um, you know, I just, I had like a bug out and I had, I think a ZT0450, um, you know, as of like 2019, something like that. I had that and like four other knives, like a Kershaw and whatever. Um, and then COVID hit and I don't know, I guess we, people just had a lot of time or, uh, and that's when I started, you know, watching a ton of YouTube and, um, trying different knives and it just kind of like went bananas from there. I went from five to, you know, 80 in a year. <laughs> it's like, you know, and then it's game over. Um, uh, and then at some point I just decided to start recording it, I guess. So, well, I have to say, I'm a little bit surprised um, just in that, uh, that you're a new collector and we're going to get to a, to, you said collecting is a bad word and we're, we're going to get to that in a second, but um, uh, I, I'm surprised that you're very new to it because 
uh, the design, the stout uh, from Devo Knives. You are one half of Devo Knives. Uh, yes. And uh, you gave me the opportunity to check out the stout recently. I just sent it back. I was just mentioning before we rolled here. That was <clears throat> absent-minded. It would have been cool to have it right in hand as we speak. Dur. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, it, it seemed to be a very, uh, I mentioned up front, a savvy design. It's got a lot of what uh, lifelong knife nerds want out of a knife. Um, but before we get to any of that, you said collecting. Uh, that's a bad word. Uh, what do you mean by that? Because if you looked in this room, I think that might be the term. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just, for me, uh, I just feel like collector means you buy, you have a lot of something, I guess, right? So it is accurate, but like I don't collect like just to have things or like have safe queens or whatever. And I'm really quick to sell things and trade them. Um, that's kind of how I keep things moving, you know, that's how I get to review a, a ton of stuff and handle a ton of stuff. I don't, you know, I'm not made of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, trading and selling and, you know, it's almost like when I unbox a knife, it's like in that unboxing, I have to decide if I'm keeping it. I don't know why my mm -hmm. brain works that way, but it's like, I'm thinking about everything I like and don't like about it. And I don't let it sink in. Like I just have to. You know, so there's a ton of knives that I've unboxed and sold like 20 minutes later. Just mm. cuts. Um, so I don't know. That's why I say it's a bad word, but it's accurate. It's just, you know, I wouldn't call myself a collector. I'd just say I'm an enthusiast or something like that. But it's all the right. same. It's just semantics. Right, right. You know, I, I, I really respect what you said. Now, I, I would love to be that Um person that disciplined person you open the box even so me i i will fall in love with the idea of a knife it just so happens i fell in love with the idea of the socom bravo and right. um i'm very happy i have it because i i love the real thing but there's a, a real chance with any knife that you get all excited about and then you lay out money for that oh, you are just convincing yourself like when you look in the mirror you're like <laughs> You know, when did Brad Pitt move into the house? Oh, that's me. You know, you see what you want to see. Uh, so I, I, I do worry about that. Yeah. No, I I do that all the time. I mean, I buy knives I'm super excited about and I get them and they just don't work for me or they don't work in general. Um, and I'm not the type of person that convinces myself it's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'll just shit on it and you know, I'll sell it or trade it or, you know, whatever. It depends on the situation. But um, I just had the it's that new Civivi button lock, the Chevalier mm -hmm. that came out. The and, uh, sheep's uh, foot one? Yeah, yeah. And I was so excited about it. Um, I don't get super excited about budget knives, but, like, sometimes I do. It depends on the knife, right? Yeah. And that just looked awesome because I had the one before it, the Conspirator, and that knife was like really well made and put together and it just, it was a drop point. And I just thought a sheep's foot would be awesome. Mm -hmm. So they announced that I bought two of them. I was really excited to get them. And I just was like super let down. <laughs> I was like oh. two days ago, I got them and unboxed them. And it was just like, they just felt like somehow they were half the quality of the you know, and it's the same company making it with the same materials, but somehow it just felt lesser. It was very strange. Um, so those are both gone. Already. But, you know, it happens all the time. So I don't know. It's just weird that we get so excited about something like that. And then, you know, it burns you. But the opposite happens, too. You know, I get something and it is as good as I think or better. And then it's, you know, the opposite effect. You get the, you get the, the new knife high off of that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes <clears throat> there's so much pressure to like something uh, that you're supposed to like, you know, like what if, what if you got a Roosevelt and you, you thought it stunk, you know, you, you'd, <sighs> you'd be like, no, 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 I'm wrong about this or, or the Koenig areas. Right. No, I'm wrong. This is a great knife. I am the fault. I am at fault here. <laughs> You know, uh, yeah. So, I mean, the 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 ability to to offload is great. So now, the ones that you keep, what are you looking for uh, for your reviews? Obviously, the ones that 
that review the best are going to be the ones you're more likely to keep. So what, what's the criteria for your reviews? Oh man. Um, you know, I like all different stuff, but I like sheep's foot blades, uh, mostly because like, it's hard for me to keep a knife. That's not a sheep's foot. I keep looking over here cause my knives are over there. Um, <laughs> But it's hard for me to uh, keep a knife that's not a sheep's foot because everything I do requires a sheep's foot blade. Like, it's just easier with a sheep's foot blade. I open pack Like, I don't lie to myself, right? I open packages. I cut shipping labels out to send packages. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I cut open stuff. I pop zip ties. I do stuff like that. I cut a little bit of cardboard. Like, you know, I don't skin animals. Like, I... I you know, there's just things I don't do that a drop point or a clip point might be good for. For me, a clip point looks amazing. I love a Bowie, but functionally, it's the opposite of what I need because the tip is going up, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I like a sheep's foot blade. Um, good action. I, you know, I have to have, you know, drop shut most of the time <laughs> needs to happen. Uh, and then detents are like my main griping point on knives like yeah it just if i have like kind of a test where i kind of test it to just where the detent breaks and if it deploys all the way and locks up you're good if it doesn't it just kind of flops out then it's not good even though i know you can just pull the flipper tab harder and it'll flip out it just bugs me um <laughs> just one of those things um so detents are really big for me um, you know, the lower on the list, honestly, is like cutting performance and, um, you know, obviously I want the grind to be good and I want the blade to be sharp, but like, it doesn't have to be, you know, a TRM Adam super slicer for me mm -hmm. to love it. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I don't know. Those would probably be the top things and aesthetics, you know, it's got to look good too. Um, I'm a, you know, superficial kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too like looks are huge they do play mm -hmm. into it and they can get me yeah. to like a knife that's maybe otherwise lacking compared to others you know i have plenty of spider co's uh i have 13 <laughs> spider co's that go mostly ignored even though they're great knives right because there are others that that get my my heart racing a little bit faster you know the aesthetics yeah, they do sure. they do matter they do matter Agreed. uh so now, this is something that becomes evident looking at your knife, the stout. Now, this is, um, yeah. I want to find out about how you collaborated to make this thing happen. But looking at this, it is a, it's an awesome blend of utility and looks because that blade is really good looking with the, especially with that swedge <laughs> and that whole nose portion. And then it dips into that thumb swale and it's all yeah. crowned on the back. So it's very comfortable. And um, and you're locked in 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 two different positions there. Um, this is uh, this is something else. So tell tell me about the design. Tell me about the birth of it, and then how it is that you uh, connected with Colin um, uh, Maison Pierre. I think is his yeah. name. Yeah, you got and, it. And and tell me about uh, how that all came to pass. Yeah. So um, the the reason you know, <laughs> it's funny. The reason this kind of exists is because uh, one of my good friends, Jake Bearded Gear, did uh, his knife, the Luft Concepts Avant, um, obviously with Ryan Rumor. And um, it kind of like inspired me, I guess, to know that, you know, some schmuck on YouTube could, you know, throw a design together and actually make it happen. Um, so I just was like, you know what? I'm going to draw a knife. So I <laughs> drew a knife on a notepad that looked like absolute poop, like a five-year-old drew it. And I'm like sending it to a few friends. I'm like, Hey, what do you think of this? Right. And it, I wish I you can't see it. I had it on my Instagram though, but um, this did not look good on a notepad. <laughs> and um, I sent it to Colin cause I had just reviewed his, uh, kubi royal design that mm, came out last mm, year mm. and that's how i met kyle I, or colin sorry not kyle um we had just been talking on on instagram because i had uh wanted to check this out 
and uh, he sent me one to review. I reviewed it, and then I sent him that drawing randomly. Um, and he's like, he's like, hey man, I can you know I can mock that up for you if you want and whatever. So he did, and he's really good at that. Like he's a graphic designer by trade. Um, so he put it together, and it was like. <laughs> 10,000 times better and he put his little touch on it and um you know he was just like here here's a design you know whatever and I was like well now it's yours too you know I mean he put his you know um he put his aesthetic on it and everything so um that's kind of how it just randomly started and then you know I, we just started contacting OEMs and went off on the project that is a lot harder than it sounds going from you know a piece of paper to an actual knife and selling it um but it was all just a big learning process and then in between we've you know worked on a bunch of other designs we have in the works and um yeah started a company and and all that good stuff but uh it all just started with me thinking i could draw a knife. <laughs> so i what does the collaboration process look like between two knife enthusiasts? Um, you you indicated that maybe your uh, your artistic skill wasn't quite uh, what you wanted it to be. What yeah. was it like uh, doing this collaboration? Oh, it was great. I mean, we work we work very well together, which is uh, very good. Um, you know, it, it depends on the project. Like on the stout, I originally drew the design and I sent it to him. He renders it up in illustrator and then we kind of go from there and just tweak little things and and kind of figure out what we want to do and then ultimately it ends up going to you know the manufacturer the oem they make their changes um to make it actually work uh better and then you know it's a whole back and forth process but um you know there's some designs where he'll just send me something and be like here's you know a design i'm working on and then i'll give him you know, things to tweak or whatever. And we just kind of work it out back and forth. It's honestly real easy. That part's simple. I, I work, for uh, us. Yeah. I work a lot in a creative collaborative environment and, and it's great when it's going great. And then, right. and then when it's not, you, you really rely on speaking the same language right. uh, to get to the bottom of things. And that's where having two knife enthusiasts, um, you know, comes in handy. You can, you can explain sure. and he can explain to you. What were your, what were your design goals and, and how did you, how would you say that they um, materialized here? So honestly, I just want to, I think this is what any designer would tell you on their first design is they want the knife that they would want to EDC. Like that's, you know, their first knife is always going to be that. Um, and then you kind of from there, you do it like, oh, this would be cool or this would be cool to try. And, you know, now we have like a slip joint design and, you know, we're talking about doing a back lock and it's like, you know, it's different than what I would want, you know. But on the first one, it's just kind of like, what do I want in a knife and what do I like about other knives? And you kind of just, you know, put it all into one. This one is a Kun Wu Knives prototype. This isn't the one that we're going with. We have QSP, but I don't have one right here. QSP is doing the final production. But, um, you know, I wanted a, a sheep's foot blade because I cut shipping labels out all the time and I open packages. Um, honestly, the kind of thumb swell right here, that was initially I put the harpoon on there because I thought it looked cool. And then I got the prototype in hand, the uh, 3D printed one. And I was like, damn, that's really comfortable. And it worked out, you know, but that wasn't by design, really. I guess it was by design, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I obviously wanted the 50-50 choil kind of deal. Um, so you got more, you know, blade length out of it, but you still get a full, big, you know, comfortable choil. And then we wanted a neutral handle um, just so it works for everyone, you know. Mm -hmm. um, especially on a first design, the kind of thought there was we want to hit as many people as we can. And initially it was a three and a half inch blade. And uh, once we got the uh, 3D prototype, we were like, mm, maybe we should dial it down to three and a quarter. And because it's like the sweet spot, you know, I mean, yeah, it is. 
it's gonna work for most people you know there's i know a lot of people who are like 3.5 nope not going that high and then i know people who are like three inch oh, i'm not going there but three yeah. three point three it's like it'll work you know um unless they have absolutely enormous hands or something well, so. that's a that's a, a sad realization I've come to recently. You know, really three and a quarter really is the magic spot. I've missed out on so many great knives because I'm a three and a half to four inch. You know, that's, uh, that's, right? Because yeah. you know, when I started got collecting folders, they were all big, and and that's what I yeah. kind of got used to. And then, what's all these little small? Uh, but I I love all designs, but I have right. to come up constantly with new justifications not to buy something. Uh, and three point two five for years has been good, but it's it's failing me now. I've been getting a lot of knives in that size range recently that's because great. some of the greatest and most useful designs are right there yeah i mean when i when i got into knives you know i was hesitant to even go over three and a quarter three inch was kind of the, the spot like i didn't see a need for a three and a half inch blade like you know working in office like you know i'm not again i'm not out like skinning deer or anything like i just <laughs> need a knife to play with because i think it's cool and open some stuff and when i need a knife i have a knife right mm -hmm. but I don't need something huge. And it's been the opposite for me where I've sort of branched up, you know, right. um, and tried bigger things. I usually end up the things I keep are in that three to three and a quarter, three and a half. I have some huge knives, but, um, you know, there's not many that stick around for sure. You're wearing a something obscene company t-shirt yeah. uh that yeah. j cape uh, oh, uh good. friend of the channel hero sticks loaned that to me <clears throat> a few months nice. back and man that was a knife yeah. that i came up with a good excuse i'm like you know that i don't like the clip so i, yeah, I'm I don't not like gonna, the clip either i'm not gonna pursue it the clip was not an issue in person and that was the comfiest <laughs> coziest uh and a little big knife at 3.25 inches the one i had or what is it i guess it's, it's three, three and a half, half. Yeah, three and a half but JK, oh man three and a half it's light. What a great knife. It's a great knife. Yeah, I don't have one. I had like I've had three or four, I think, but I've ended up selling the clip to me. I so I'm left-handed, right? And I carry all righty knives back left pocket because I can carry them where the blade is against the seam. Yep. I can grab it with my left hand. And it's just kind of worked for me because like halfway through last year, um, I had I had gotten a Trevor Burger. LEXK. This is a smaller one, the Urban. But, um, and I carried it in my front left pocket. I still did that. And it opened up at one yeah. point and I went right in there and it just got me right between the webbing. Um, and it went in like a quarter of an inch or half an inch. Um, so ever since then, I'm like, I'm not carrying a righty knife in my front left pocket ever again. So I carry back left pocket and that clip on the J Cape, it's shaped like a lightning bolt. Um, it's just terrible to get in your, your pocket, your back pocket. That's a little bit looser than your front pocket. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and you don't have as good control cause you're not looking at it. You're just kind of like shoving the knife in. Um, so I just had a lot of trouble with that clip and that's why I, I've never kept them, but I kept buying them because it's so cool <laughs> and it looks great. The action's great. The freaking sounds that thing makes. Yeah. Um, are ridiculous but yeah uh, well, but they did make a new clip that doesn't have the shape it's like a normal clip with a lightning bolt sort of like pocket in it so oh, it still okay. has it but it's more functional right right uh, i i didn't even mind the actual lightning bolt clip when i got it it was just all all, all misgivings melted away with that <laughs> right uh, one thing yeah. that that uh, the stout shares with that knife is a hollow grind now hollow grind yeah. is my all, has always been my preference right. and Same and here. and since long before i knew why uh i i just always used to like the way it looked it reminded me of a straight razor it had menace you know i've been right. i've been into knives since i was uh less mature than i am now and uh, <laughs> you know that stuff mattered and then later i realized wow and they really cut <laughs> you know oh, really yeah. really well so uh, how did you decide on a hollow grind and and tell me what your plans are and 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 also the blade steel yeah. So the hollow grind, I just love a hollow grind. It's kind of born from 
getting a lot of Riot made knives mm. and they do such a good hollow grind um, that it kind of got me hooked on it. And um, so that's what we wanted. And it is, there's just certain things with Chinese OEMs that um, it's just a battle. And hollow grinds is one of them. There's some OEMs, it turns out a lot because we've been dealing with like five or seven OEMs at this point with different projects and things. And, you know, more than half of them, it's like, you want a hollow grind, they push back and they want to do a flat grind. Um, and I think it's because they can do a CNC flat grind. They can just computerize it and have the machine do it. And a hollow grind, I think just takes a little more skilled labor that maybe some mm -hmm. of them don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just like a battle. And with QSP, who's doing the production, it went from, you know, we can't do it to, you know, we will do it on half the prototypes. <laughs> and then they did it on, on, they accidentally did it only on two prototypes. And then it was a very shallow hollow grind. And just progressively through like four or five months, I've gone from, they can't do a hollow grind to now in final production, it's going to be like a nice deeper hollow grind. What I want, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. This one on this prototype is really good from, from Kun Wu. It's kind of hard to see that the hollow grind, I don't know how to show you a good angle. Maybe that. Yeah. That's a good angle right there. The, the tip a little bit, but um, it's going to be roughly this deep, which is <clears throat> really good. Um, the one you checked out, the one you reviewed, um, which by the way, thank you for taking the time to look at it. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, that one had the hollow grind, but it's, it's shallow. Um, so it's going to be deeper than that, which I think it'll make it slicier. It'll make it, I think better for EDC. It won't be as, you know, stout, so to speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think the trade-off is positive because again the knife it'll do some it'll do harder work but it's meant to just be kind of an everyday carry knife right right for the for the <clears throat> the purposes you're mentioning hollow grind is absolutely the way to go you're not using this to baton through sticks or anything right. like that this is not a uh, survival knife though it could be um <laughs> but but just to have that utility okay now tell me about okay you mentioned the um the fact that you use a tip a lot in the kind of work yeah. you do, and that led to the sheep's foot. Uh, tell me this. Why not a worn cliff? So first, if I had my, my way, I would, I think I would have done a hawk's bill first, but I just knew it wouldn't sell. So we didn't do Smart it. Man. But a hawk's bill is just for me is the perfect blade shape. Cause it's just going to, it has, an excellent just really stout tip that's gonna you know do everything i need which again is basically all tip and then you know if you need to pop a zip tie or get behind something you know you can hook it with the bill but a sheep's foot is kind of like you know second best in terms of that um and to me i just think a sheep's foot looks better than a worn cliff mm -hmm. so it's mostly functionally they're to me, they're pretty much the same. I mean, you're going to get, I guess, a straighter edge on a warning. Um, but a sheep's foot just looks better. So uh, I'm into this one does. <laughs> so this, I, I got to say, this one does. I'm ordinarily yeah. way more partial to a worn cliff, something with more of a point. This one has a nice point for a sheep's like, foot. And like uh, yes, yeah, that's a cool one. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's nice. That is quite a. A nice point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. Uh, but but the the addition of the point with the hollow grind, yeah, um, it is just one hundred percent good to go. And then you ch uh, you mm -hmm. chose twenty CV. Uh, tell me about that choice. Yeah. So it's again, I'm I'm pretty uh, you know basic guy here, but I just didn't want to do M three ninety. That was the thought behind it. Was everybody does M three ninety. There's M390 fatigue. Um, again, thinking what, what are people going to buy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I like M390. I have no issues with it. But again, it's sort of like people are just bored of it. 20 CV is literally the same composition as M390. But 
it's an American steel. And some people just like it better for some reason, which is odd. But for three, it's just not as it's not on as many knives. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we wanted either 20 CB or LMAX would have been my my preferred steel. Well, actually, my preferred steel would have been Vanex, but nobody can get the stuff. Um, so then it was LMAX or 20 CV, and they could get 20 CV. So we went with that. Well, I, I like and appreciate you're going with 20 CV because it's an American steel. And, uh, right. you know, you're right. M390 is on every. That's kind of like a calling card, the way a titanium frame lock was a few oh, years yeah. back. For sure. Uh, but also on something like this, whose prescribed purpose is everyday carry and use, I think uh, just like with all um, with this kind of knife and smaller knives, I like the super, the harder super steels right. because they do get more use. And, uh, you know, I have a big collection of larger tactical style knives that I prize and they're all wicked sharp. But, you know, it's not like I'm out there like I use my Kubi Vagrant more than most other knives, <laughs> right, you know, of course. Um, yeah. so uh, the 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 thought of having 20 CV on the stout and having it pretty much good to go all the time. And then occasionally you, you, you will you strap it and occasionally touch it up on a rod or something like that. It makes the most right. sense to me. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's done well, you know, um, that's another sort of battle with oems it turns out is heat treat mm. um i have I fought like a three-week battle with qsp on going up one hrc like the the recommended from crucible is 59 to 61 and to me it should be 60 or above right like obviously <laughs> not something crazy but what i wanted was like 62 or 63 because that's from my research and like I even talked to Laren Thomas and like just tried to get information on it. And it just seemed like 62, 63 would be the optimal range. You get the best out of the edge retention, but you're not getting it too hard right. to where it becomes brittle or whatever. Um, but the OEMs just, they go off the recommendation and I guess somewhere, I don't know, Crucible says if you hit this range, this could start happening or I don't know. So it was just this long battle, and I just wanted to get over 60. Like, I wanted 60 to 62 and just could not get them to budge. Like, they would do it if, like, ultimately they were like, we'll do it, but we're not going to be responsible for anything. So, well, is this where a thin that's kind of sucks to hear? <laughs> we're not going to be responsible, but right, is, this, right. is this where a thin hollow grind comes in where they? Excuse me, were they um, uh, nervous about making a thin hollow grind and making it harder than um, prescribed? Uh, I didn't get that response. Uh, I mostly got the steel could start yellowing or tips could break easily. Um, and again, we're talking about one, one HRC, which right. they're probably going to end up at the lower end of the range anyway. So, like, I just didn't see why, but... I'm not going to be there like watching them do it. So I just couldn't take the risk, you know, or we couldn't take the risk and say, go ahead and do it. And then right. if anything happens, you know, now they can just say, well, it was the heat treat. And then, you know, it's on us. Oh yeah. Um, so I had to concede. So it's 59 to 61. The prototypes were both at the two that were tested were both at 60, um, which the, the coded one was 59, but you have to deduct an HRC for the coding. So oh, it was 60. Um, it, as long as they're 60, 61, I'm happy with it. You know, I just, I don't know. From what I could tell, if it's like 57, 58, that's when you're in trouble, right? And, you know, of course, the range is 59 to 61, but I just wanted to kind of knock it up one, but I lost the battle. So, but I won the hologram battle. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm betting. <laughs> I'm batting 500. Hey, you know, that, that hollow grind, even if it's not as deep as you want it, I know you're going to get it as deep as you want it, but even, yeah. even if it were how it is on the prototype right now, it's still better than a flat grind. And it's so, yeah. it's just, it's so nice to cut with. It is really yeah, nice to cut is. with. Um, yeah. I was surprised at how good this knife actually got. Um, <laughs> I was actually surprised at, like how good the knife was in general. I know that sounds kind of weird, but um, I've never 
designed a knife. I've never, you know, really had anything like done anything like that before. So it was a very cool experience to do it and then actually get the prototypes in hand and be like, damn, this mm -hmm. actually like is good, you know? Um, I don't mean that like tooting my own horn type of way. I just mean like it was, I don't know. It was just kind of cool. Yeah, I know what you mean. You dreamt <laughs> something up, you put it on paper, you figured it out with someone else and you made it happen and you're holding it in your yeah. hand. It can now cut stuff and now you're selling them. Like that's a big deal, <laughs> especially if you've never done something like that before. Yeah. You know? So uh, you, you also, another design choice that I absolutely love, and this is something that is uh, a, a, a sort of a newfound um, love and the stout helped hammer this home, uh, but bolster locks. I love bolster locks. They are, everything should be a bolster lock as far <laughs> as I'm concerned, because you can slow roll without worrying. I fat finger knives all the time. You right. can flip if, if that had a flipper which it does not, but if it had a flipper, it would be no problem. Same thing with the uh, with using just the thumb on a slow roll or just flicking it in there, which is not the most comfortable for me, but you can still do it right. because it's a bolster lock. Is that why you chose that? So uh, we chose the bolster lock because I'm left-handed. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, to me, a knife needs to just operate. So one of my things that we were talking earlier about what I what I want in a knife when I review it or what I keep. And a lot of it is, can I pick the knife up and operate it without having to do a bunch of adjustment? Because that's something that bugs me as a left handed person, um, like just a right handed frame lock. Right. You pick it up and your thumb is right on top of the lock bar if you go to Spidey Flick, which this knife was designed basically to spidey flick. It works with a thumb, but you know, we designed it to do this. Um, and if you did that with a frame lock, it would just get completely locked up and there's no way you're going to flick it out. So a bolster lock just negates that issue, but you still get to me. I still love a frame lock. Um, I just think it's a little sturdier than a liner lock. Um, I just enjoy the action. This is going to sound weird, but I like having it hit my mm -hmm. nail and then drop <laughs> shut. I have really jacked up thumbnails because of it, but um, I enjoy it. And you, you don't get that with the other lock, obviously a liner lock, but um, you know, if it was like an axis lock or back lock, you wouldn't be able to really do that. Um, so that was kind of the thinking. So lefties can use it. That's why we also did the reversible clip. Mm -hmm. um this one i was testing the lynch clip and the rips garage tech replacement clips for wire clips um for people who don't want a wire clip you can get a milled clip um but yeah we want to make it lefty friendly and the bolster lock does that so that's kind of the reasoning there uh i was talking to uh um brent smith uh bald man uh knife and tool and uh we were talking about he he works on cars for a living and he likes um wire clips because he can go in and out of cars right. hit the steering wheel hit the uh and not gouge them and i thought that was a very right. interesting um a take on why the the wire clip is so valuable i just like them just i just like them right uh, but the why did way. you choose them yeah so uh I just have found wire clips to be the most functional. They just mm -hmm. work. They go in pocket really well. They come out of pocket really well. I've never had a wire clip that I've been like, oh, it's too tight or that's too loose, you know? Right. Like wire clips just work well. Um, and like you said, you bang into something, it won't, it'll do less damage to the thing you're hitting and less damage to the clip. Um, and the other reason is, most of the time, if you see a wire clip, it's reversible. So to me, right. that meant that somehow it's easier to have a reversible clip when you use a wire clip versus a mill clip. So I thought it made more sense um, to do that. Plus, with the wire clip, as long as you do the spacing right, you can get options like this or right. Rips Garage Tech that's literally a milled clip. You can get Timascus ones. like So people can still fancy up their knife with a milled clip if that's what they really want um but you can't put a wire clip on a, a knife that has a milled clip you know it's kind of like yeah 
And then you got to design a clip that works with the I, I don't know. I think milled clips are good when they're done very well, but it's hard to do them well. And that's another thing. Again, it's like our first design. I just wanted to get things right. And the wire clip is just kind of a safe choice if you want to look at it that way. It's also hard for a user to do anything with a milled clip that isn't perfect. Um, you know, with a with a right. with a spring clip, you can bend it a little, you can take it off, you can tweak it. True. But I I'd be I'd be hesitant to do that on an expensive milled titanium clip. So let's for talk sure. about so you you chose QSP as your OEM for the staff. Yeah. How what what was the deciding factor, would you say? Communication. Um, so just in general, like in my you know career and everything, I am very big on communication and it just really bothers me when you don't get responses or they're delayed or, you know, just poor communication. It's such a simple thing, mm -hmm. but it's critical, right? And um, we did work with two OEMs on prototypes, Kun Wu being one of them. And they did it, you know, they did a good job on the knives, Kun Wu did, as well as QSP. Um, I'd say QSP, like, crushed it and Kun Wu did good, you know, mm -hmm. like I don't have anything, you know, negative really to say about them. They've been fine. We're actually working with them on something else. Um, but QSP was like, you send them an email, you get a response that night. Now they're in China. So it's always going to be kind of an overnight thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you catch them at the right time, you can kind of go back and forth a little bit, but usually it's like, I shoot off an email. They respond to me at 3 a.m., <laughs> And then I shoot up an email, then they respond. So it can be a little frustrating going back and forth on small details. Like I'm just trying to explain this one thing, like, Hey, there's a sharp <laughs> corner here. Right. And I want it to be chamfered in production. That could take me three days just to get that yeah. squared away, you know? Right. Um, so it just kind of like stretches everything out. You're not just like on a phone call or, text messaging back and forth where you can just, you know, go back and forth and figure things out. It's a kind of a process. Um, and having quick and just good communication, it makes that so much better. Now, if you look at OEMs like QSP or Best Tech um, or, you know, Riot, you could throw in there, they cost more, right? You're paying more for the knives, mm -hmm. but this is kind of what you get with that. You get a higher level of service, you know? Um, the product is also fantastic. Um, but to me, I'd, I'd rather pay more and get excellent communication than pay way less and not get that. that yeah. Sense. You'd be biting your nails the whole time. This is already a nerve wracking right. um, uh, sure. venture, I would imagine. Uh, not inexpensive, I'm sure. Um, so tell me about how this, uh, uh, talk a little bit about how you, once you, you decide, okay, this is the OEM for us, they're going right. to produce it for, for the cost we want and all of this. How do you mm -hmm. go about the, um, the pre-order and that whole thing? Tell us how you released the yeah. knife to the world. So we made sure we got as many prototypes as we could afford, right? So we ordered four, which again, First knife, me and Colin are paying everything out of pocket for this, right? Um, trying to make this happen. So we paid, I think, like 1200 bucks for four prototypes uh, from QSP. So we did, again, we used other OEMs for prototypes. But um, we paid 1200 bucks for prototypes. We wanted to get enough so we could send them around to reviewers like you um, and, I guess, myself. Um and we got them in first step was are they good because <laughs> like if they're not good enough for me i'm not gonna sell them i'm not gonna send them around i don't need feedback if i don't if i don't think they're good right um so that part if you watch you can watch my unboxing of the prototypes um from qsp my first time seeing them and i was just like blown away you know which it was one of those moments where I had high expectations and it worked out, you know? <laughs> nice. um, so from there it was, I'm going to send these out as quick as I can to as many channels as I can. I went on marketing overdrive, right? Um, 
So we got him out to like, I don't know, we must have hit like 15 or so 20 channels before the pre-order even hit. Um, we got him in early March. We set the pre-order for April 9th. So we had a month to send him around. I was trying to keep people to like three or four days with them mm -hmm. at that time. Um, and then we, you know, had to build a website, uh, which we already kind of had in the works, but, you know, we started dialing it in. Um, then we had to do, you know, promotional video, uh, backpack B helped us with a video on that. Um, I reached out to, I had awesome suggestions from viewers actually. Um, I had multiple people reach out to me. One guy said, Hey, why don't you contact knife news? And I was like, mm -hmm. knife news, it's <clears throat> not a bad idea. So I reached out to knife news and lo and behold, the guy was interested and we did a sort of interview and he made an article about the stout that posted like the, you know, like five days before the pre-order. Um, I had another guy hit me up and say, you should talk to Jim Skelton um you know he does reviews pretty quick and he might like it so I, I never talked to jim skelton i reached out to him and he's like yeah sure he dropped his review like i don't know two days before the pre-order or something um so we kind of got lucky a little bit there but we, you know i sent it to everybody i could talked to everybody i could posted about it a good trillion times um <laughs> you know just went hard and uh then on April 9th, we, you know, opened the website up and prayed. <laughs> uh, and it went well. We sold out in like 13 hours. Um, nice. Congratulations. Like, thank you. Yeah, it was like freaking amazing <coughs> to just have that happen. Um, I don't know what I was expecting. I just like our goal was to sell enough to order them. And just anything after that was cake, right? Um, you know, that means we're not making any money. Like we're actually going to be losing money, but at least, Hey, we get to, you know, make the knives and have it be real. Right. Um, but you know, our expectations kind of got blown out of the water and people loved the knife and ordered it. And, uh, you know, and then we've been making changes along the way. So that whole time we were, you know, gathering feedback from reviewers and, taking in suggestions and whatever we could do to improve the knife we were going to do. Right. Um, so, you know, we knocked down some sharp corners. Um, we decided to go for the deeper hollow grind, kind of fought that battle till we won. Um, uh, we adjusted the clip to take these replacement clips. The QSP mm -hmm. prototypes didn't. Um, we updated some spacing on the lock bar. We added, this one has the lock bar access kind of cut out right here. Oh yeah. And the QSP one didn't have that. We added that. Um, we made some other small changes um, and that was all just community feedback. Like it was awesome to get that kind of feedback. And there were a lot of those things I hadn't even thought of like the, the sharp corner up here yeah. above the, the lock bar. Um, I had never, felt it in my hand ever but i had you know a couple people mention it and and then i'm kind of feeling the knife and i could see how you could hit mm -hmm. that corner you know um you know, i i did notice that too but the only way i noticed it is because i was rubbing every single surface i was like <laughs> right. man that's so nice it's not just chamfered everything is rounded it's just such a yeah. comfortable knife and then that was the one little spot and i was like oh and then and then you sent me um a text that day saying oh we're gonna knock off this one sharp corner and i was like it's that <laughs> we're gonna go hollower and uh, so right. um so are, are you guys headed to blade show uh in june and and what's what are you expecting from that yeah so we actually we got a table for blade show so we'll be there i'm working on getting like the you know tablecloth and all that stuff made mm -hmm. right now um but we won't have any knives to sell because we don't have them yet they should be here hopefully in august um but we did send four prototypes to the knife modders and we're going to have them pimp them out and then we'll do something, you know, maybe auction them off or um, sell. I don't know what we'll do. We'll do something with them. Cool. So we can at least, you know, get a few of them out there and have something at blade show. Um, hopefully we have other prototypes by then. I don't know. 
you know, it's a month away at this point. And, yeah, yeah. But we do have um, two designs in prototype phase with Kubi that are supposed to be done mm-hmm. by then. Um, we have another one that's an exclusive. Uh, it's a design we licensed to a dealer. Uh, we might have those prototypes by then. Uh, I think that would be it by then but we might it's possible we have three other design prototypes there um Mm. along with the stout but um yeah we're just gonna go and you know have fun and check everything out and it's gonna be our first time you know exhibiting and not attending my first time going was last year so yeah yeah me too um, yeah you'll get to meet your adoring public and and, (laughs) and to really get like get that i mean that'll put wind in your sails i could imagine because a lot of people have checked it out uh and that now a lot of people are really looking forward to it what about uh dealers do you guys have any dealers lined up or how are is are you going straight direct sales so on the pre-order we did direct sales for 350 of them uh those are the ones that sold out and then the following wednesday urban edc supply did a pre-order as well uh, we gave them a certain amount of units to sell. They actually still have uh, a few. I don't think there's many left, but we had a lot of micarta ones all together, and that's they only had micarta. So um, if you still want one, there you go. You can hit up Urban EC Supply. But um, so they'll have them. They'll probably get more when they come in too. Uh, I have another uh, dealer that I'm pretty close with white mountain knives. Uh, mm-hmm. they'll probably have some when they come in. Um, and for the stout, I think that's it. I mean, we're not opposed to working with dealers. Obviously if we sell direct, you know, we, we make more off of it. Um, which is good because everything we're making is going right back into new designs. And, you know, we're not like, we haven't taken any money out, and put it in our accounts or anything. It's all going right back in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're trying to just build this until we can maybe go full time in a year or two. So it's just kind of all funds are going in there, but um, uh, we do have a dealer exclusive that we're working on. Um, and I can't really, you know, talk about it. And then we have another one we licensed to a dealer coming out. So we're definitely working with dealers and we have nothing against if dealers reach out and they want to, you know, buy some, we'll definitely be open to it. That'll be fun at Blade Show, I think, to, you know, talk to dealers and make those relationships. I have some just from, you know, the reviewer world, uh, you know, that I talk to a lot. Um, But meeting some other folks, I think it'll be, be a good time uh yeah i mean most most definitely um this is the kind of a um guidance counselor question but what do you guys like hope uh what do you hope devo knives first of all you got to tell me the meaning of devo knives and then uh what do you hope it to be say in 10 years or when it's matured yeah so (laughs) the meaning um this is silly but my my nickname is uh the detent diva (laughs) Cause I'm, no. <laughs> uh, I'm a little bit crazy about detents and uh, we were trying to come up with a name and like, we just were struggling and Colin messaged me. He's like, Hey, what about Devo knives? And I was like, what the hell is a Devo? Right. And he said, uh, Devo is a male diva. And I was like, all right. And I don't know, we just kind of rolled with it. And then we, um, we decided to do all beer related names. So, this one's the stout. We have um, we have the growler, the mash. We have the uh, barley, and we have another mm-hmm. one called the buzz. Those are all in um, all the ones we're working on right now. So we have kind of a theme going, which makes it a little easier to name stuff. That's cool. Um, yeah, and I mean, in ten years, that's you know, I'm looking at in a couple years, I'd like to be doing this full time. Um, so. We're not just like doing one knife and then, you know, we're just going to keep making that. And I, I get one side of that, which is you're taking a design, you're perfecting it, you're making it better. And you're just coming out with reiterations of a great knife, making it better and better. I get that. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can do that and do other designs. Right. Um, Especially with two of us, I think it makes it 
a little easier. Um, so we, you know, we have a lot in the works. If all goes well, um, you know, we have what, uh, one, we have like five knives in the works right now that are getting prototyped in some sense. Um, so we could have all those released by sometime next year. And then we keep going that rate. We should be able to, you know, uh, build it up to where in two years is my goal to be doing it full time. Um, and then who knows where it goes from there. Just, you know, um, I don't know if we'll end up being like spider co or something, but if we ever get the chance to bring, you know, production into, you know, in-house, you know, that's a whole topic we could talk about is China versus U S um, the short kind of synopsis of that is there's no options here. So mm -hmm. um, there's really no way, especially when you're just coming from the ground up and trying to build something um, you don't really have an option to use an OEM here, but we would love to at some point or start doing it ourselves, you know, if we can and learn, um, but yeah, you know, just keep cracking away and hopefully it becomes, you know, a full-time thing. That's my goal right now. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I was happy to hear that, uh, Devo is a male diva. Cause that's yeah. what my wife calls me when I'm being precious about. Oh, something. really? Yeah. You're being a Devo. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Where are my <laughs> cucumbers? <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so since you are, um, you're not only a, a um, a knife designer and a proprietor owner operator of a, of a knife company. You are also a knife reviewer. Therefore yep. you are um, subject to my speed round at the okay. end of this here. Interview. All right. So, so they're just uh, one, one word answers and I will supply you with those. Are you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Fixed or folder folder flipper or thumb stud. I don't like eat, uh, flipper. Sorry. Uh, washers or bearings? Bearings. Tip up or tip down? Uh, tip up. The good one. Up. The good one. <laughs> uh, Tanto or Bowie? Oof, Tanto. For that secondary point, right? For utility. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, hollow ground or flat ground? Hollow. Full size or small? Uh, full size. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Gentleman's knife. Automatic or bally song? Automatic. Riot or Reich? Riot. Benchmade or Spyderco? Each. Uh, <laughs> neither. Uh, Spyderco. <laughs> uh, Civivi or Kaiser? Actually, now Kaiser. <laughs> Me too. Mill titanium or spring clip? All right, wait, yeah, milled titanium or spring? Milled. Carbon fiber or micarta? Carbon fiber. Finger choil or no choil? Finger choil. Come on, got to have a choil. Yeah, I know, I know. Form or function? Form. I'm with you there. It's hard to admit, <laughs> especially in this it's climate. It's not for me, but yeah. You know, I get it. There's definitely some shame there for that. But why can't it be both? Eggs. Thank you, sir. And then last but not least, your desert island knife. Now, this is not for your survival on a desert island. This is the one knife you get to keep for the rest of your life. And you already get the stout, so don't don't include that. Well, I have two of these, but uh, it would be the rosy. You've got two of them, eh? Yeah, if you make me pick one, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to get a third one, but this would be the one I'd pick. I think this one. Kevin's choice. Yeah, that's uh, the milling. That is a beautiful man. I had the opportunity to check one out. Um, uh, it was um, it was Jake's actually. He loaned me his. Yeah. And man alive, that was such a sweet knife, and what a what a generous loan out that was. Yeah, well, Kevin, thank knife. you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Yeah, it's been a, a pleasure to talk about uh, this evolution of devo knives and i can't wait to see where it goes from here and thanks again for loaning me that stout what a sweet knife it is indeed of course thanks for having me man. it was great it's my pleasure all righty sir take care have a good one have a knife you want featured or reviewed 
Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. There he goes, Kevin Johnson, Kev from Lefty EDC. There are a couple uh, couple of stouts from Devo Knives left on Urban EDC. Go check that out. Post haste, uh, it might be gone by the time you're hearing this. Uh, they might be gone. Uh, in any case, it was a pleasure meeting him and, like I said, uh, experiencing his knife. Experience other great interviews here every Sunday. And, of course, there's the Wednesday Supplemental and Thursday Night Knives, our live streaming show. Uh, if you want to become a member uh, through Patron, Patreon, and you want to help support the show, you think what we do here is valuable, you can scan that QR code or just go to the knifejunkie.com slash patreon so for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer thanks for listening to the knife junkie podcast if you enjoyed the show please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com for show notes for today's episode additional resources and to listen to past episodes visit our website theknifejunkie.com you can also watch our latest videos on youtube at theknifejunkie.com slash youtube Check out some great knife photos on the knifejunkie.com slash Instagram and join our Facebook group at the knifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487. And you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.